Hello guys. I'm audible and visible. Uh, sorry for coming on a bit late. Sorry, a bit early. Right. So welcome back. So what we are going to do here is we are going to continue whatever we have been doing for the past 15-20 days in the An Academy app. We are going to continue the Robin's image-based sessions. Uh, we have we have stopped in between uh, female gender track, if I believe. Fine. Hello, Karthik. And so I'll be continuing from that. Today we'll be going for the rest of the ovarian tumors and breast parenchymal lesions. Then in the subsequent classes till the end of uh, this week, we'll be having endocrine, we'll, have, we'll cover skin, we'll cover musculoskeletal, orthopedics and also your CNS. Fine. Hello, Jalebi, bye. Okay. So let's start. Without any delay, we should go ahead and cover uh, today's topic. As usual, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a uh, few MCQs based on the ovarian lesions and the testicular lesions we saw in the last class and then we'll continue today's sessions right? okay so first to start with as you guys must have been knowing that the mock is on february 16th 9 a.m uh, good evening region good evening taku uh, so hope you will get time to attend it and uh, please attend it on a laptop and make sure that it is it's like a real mock simulation it'll help you to assess your progress for the upcoming exams right and this combat, it's on 19th February 6 p.m. Uh, if you're free that time, please do attend it. And there are lots of prizes. And there are also gadgets to be won as well. Hope you are the one who deserves the prize and you get it. Fine. And if you want to subscribe to Plus, you can. And these are the February month test. Please use whatever is required for you. Whichever subject you feel is weak, please do attend them and make use of them. Okay. And the previous edition of the Robins image-based classes from the chapter 1, Till the female gender act will be on the Academy app. Under my profile, if you go to special classes, you will find them. Fine. So without any delay, we shall start the first question. And I want you guys to comment. I'll give you 30 seconds. Look at the image, look at the question, comment on that. We'll discuss three questions maybe, and then we will be going towards today's class of uh, female gender act and breast parenchyma. The time starts now. Anyone comments? I want you guys to comment. It's fine if it's wrong. Still, you have one fourth of getting the correct answer, even if it's a random guess. There are definitely clues there. Okay, I'll read through the question and see if we can uh, come to a quite, uh, conclusion. A 37 year old person noticed a bilateral breast enlargement over the past six months. Okay, actually started with D, Yogesh has gone with B, Staphylococcus A, Thai, Q, Princess D. Okay, let's see. Now on physical examination, both the breasts were enlarged without masses. And the right testis is 1.5 times larger than the left testis. So there's a right testicular lesion with a breast enlargement, which means it's a hormone secreting tumor. With, uh, with these two lines, I can get a, come to a conclusion, it's a hormone secreting tumor, fine. And rightly said so, estrogen is increased here, fine. An ultrasound shows a 2 cm circumscribed mass in the right testis. Orchidectomy was done. Shows so and so cut surface. That's fine. Microscopic appearance is shown here. Actually, the following line has also written what the microscopic appearance is. If you don't have the microscopic appearance, if you look at this, you have some rod shaped crystals here, right? Can you appreciate them? These are your Arinkis crystalloids. Okay. These are Arinkis crystalloids, the rod shaped crystals. That's very, very characteristic of the disease. The same thing has been given in the question also. With the electron microscopy cells have rod shaped crystalloids of Renke, what is the most likely diagnosis? Crystalloids of Renke are very, very characteristic of leading cells. Even in a normal leading cell, you will have Renke crystalloids. It's not only in the leading cell tumor, this is a finding seen in a normal leading cell. In a normal testicular biopsies, also, you can see Renke crystalloids. So, if you see this doesn't make it a tumor, you should have history. There's a history of hormone secreting lesion, plus you have a Renke crystalloid, so we have to see what it is. Fine. So uh, even without the image, bilateral breast enlargement, gynecomastia and secreting estrogen. Do you guys think choriocastoma will secrete estrogen? Will it cause bilateral breast mass? Just a simple uh, thing, right? It won't. Embryonal carcinoma is not hormonally secreting. They also don't secrete hormone. Gonadoblastoma, to some extent, yes, they can secrete. But I am going to ask you a simple clue. I am sure most of you know the answer of that as well. 
it's a blastemal tumor gonadoblastoma so if it's a blastemal tumor what do you think will be the age group for any blastemal tumor the age group is the same the microscopy will have small round blue cells it's a blastoma every blast group every blastemal tumor will be seen in younger age group right first or second decade most likely less than 20 years almost always less than 20 years right so i'm having an age group of 37 which is an adult an adult having a gonadoblastoma is a very 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 unlikely scenario your nephroblastoma neuroblastoma retinoblastoma medulloblastoma right everything will be less than 10 years 20 years only blastomal tumors are seen in children it will not be seen in adult by that information i can rule that out so only option with the history also have only one thing which is leading cell tumor right so if you want to go via microscopy you have your classical brain crystalloids that's diagnostic of this tumor fine okay so shall we go to the next question i want you to look at the question read the history try to come to a conclusion with the history and look at the image and let's see if you can diagnose it i'll go mute for 30 seconds uh, look at the image as well as the history and come to an answer i hope it is visible any comments i'll give you history uh, the gland is from prostate and there are the cells are a bit hyperplastic that's a history for you staphylococcus started with a anyone wants to add on no other comments okay we'll go through the question we'll go through history if you have any such clues in the history fine bovana has also answered a The 71 year old person who came for checkup physical examination there's nothing there because the patient's age and there's supposed to be some family history his prostate specific antigen was done which is 8 nanograms per ml for a 71 it is still slightly higher but it can be your bph it can be a prostatitis it can be many many things right it's not remarkably high 6 months later psa is 10 nanograms per ml in 2 months increase in 2 nanogram per ml is not a good sign because the velocity is there you must have read in surgery psa velocity psa density everything it is bit more for 2 nanogram to elevate in 6 months it's definitely something to be worried about fine okay uh, urologist has obtained a transrectal biopsy specimen the microscopy shows multifocal areas of glandular hyperplasia and the appearance as shown in the image the question itself said that i'm having glandular hyperplasia and this image fine so if you look at this this part can you say that this definitely hyperchromatic whatever i have shaded Yes, it is definitely hyperchromatic, right? It's more cells, and as well as it is hyperchromatic, right? When you look at this cell, compared to this cell, it's definitely hyperchromatic. Increase in chromatia, hyperchromatia, high NC ratio, pleomorphism. What is the diagnosis? You have all these findings in this particular gland. Does it mimic a malignant tissue? It does kind of mimic a malignant tissue, right? But at the same time, what are these cells? If you attended the last class in prostate. I told there are two cells in the gland. One is epithelium. The last behind one is myoepithelial cells, right? So if a myoepithelial cell is seen, which means it is not an invasive carcinoma, that's one for sure. But I have definitely areas of hyperplasia, which is not looking good. So this diagnosis is PIN. This is called as a prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, like a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. we do have some decrease in prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia it's inside the epithelium fine uh no i am not the professor in aims bhuvaneshwar okay if there's a resemblance apologies for that fine so it's in prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia that's a diagnosis here fine okay so when you look at this now so when i have a patient with a, a prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia or let's say cervical intraepithelial neoplasia will it have an increase in risk of a carcinoma definitely will right So the answer is here. There will be definitely an associated increased risk of invasive carcinoma. Fine. Staphylococcus. Your first answer was correct. So this is a learning experience for us. Mark for review is not a good choice, right? So whatever you thought first and whatever you answered as option A is was right. The two times you changed, both of them went wrong. Fine. So this is a case of a prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, and definitely it will increase the risk of carcinoma. It's not a chronic inflammation of the obstructive tap. 
this is not BPH, so I am not going to see them in a peripheral zonal transition loop. It's related to an inherited tumor suppressor gene mutation. No, this is not related to inherited tumor suppressor gene mutation. I want you to ask a question and I want you guys to answer which tumor suppressor gene inherited mutation will likely increase the risk of prostate cancer or which tumor suppressor gene will have prostate cancer. I'm sure you know the answer. There's one very known tumor suppressor gene which can increase the risk of prostate cancer. Also breast cancer. You must have heard of this. You must have definitely heard of this, right? No, BRCA1 and 2. BRCA1, BRCA2 definitely has an increased risk of prostate cancer, right? Now, this microscopy definitely suggests of PIN, right? So why can't it be BRCA related? Can, it, can a prostate cancer be BRCA related? For sure it can be, right? So why I said this is not the answer here. Can anyone, uh, any, anyone substantiate that? Yeah, BRCA2 most likely. Why can't it be BRCA related? The reason is age group. A 71 year old person will not have an inherited carcinoma. If it is BRCA related, definitely it must have been like 30, 40 years. I won't expect 71 year old related person to have an inherited syndrome. It is undoubtedly acquired here, fine. That's the reason this is the wrong answer. If the same history comes, let's say about uh, your uh, uh, 20, uh, 30, 40 years old, yeah, I will think of an inherited tumor suppressor gene mutation, most likely maybe BRCA. That could both BRCA1 as well as BRCA2 can cause it. Cause it. Uh, BRCA2 will have more instances of men breast cancer and prostate cancer, right? Okay, fine. The last question, after this we'll go to the images of Robbins, fine? So again, I'll go on mute. 30 seconds, read the question and come to an answer. Thank you, Karthik. So, answer for this. Anyone wants to take a go, go ahead. There are subtle clues in the image. Uh, I might highlight you. This is a clue here. I hope you pick up whatever I have ticked, and most likely you will come to the right answer. Tell me what is the structure I ticked just now. Uh, that is not me, pal. What is the structure I have ticked? Okay, great. You guys have gone with the answer. So what I have ticked here is a nerve, right? So what I have ticked here is a nerve. So the image here shows a classical perineural invasion, right? It's image here close in classical perineural invasion. So if I'm having a perineural invasion, can I say with confidence it is undoubtedly your uh, um, carcinoma, it cannot be a benign prostatic hyperplasia, it has to be a prostatic adenocastma. Though that's not a corpora amylasia, they claim a corpora amylasia will be a pink color substance which will be seen in the lumen. Corpora amylasia will be seen in the lumen, it will not be surrounding, that's a nerve bundle here, fine. So this is a biopsy of a prostatic adenocarcinoma. So now coming to the options, I am not going to the history, my question is which of the following is most likely to increase the risk factor of prostatic adenocarcinoma, right? I will ignore the big history, fine. Exposure to naphthalamine compounds, what disease will it cause? I'm sure you know this, this came the reason need, need exam as well. Rishab, I want you to answer. Exposure to naphthalamine will cause bladder carcinoma or a prostate carcinoma? Will cause a bladder cancer, right? So naphthalamine's exposure will increase the risk of a bladder carcinoma, not much of a prostate carcinoma. Overproduction of estrogen, again it's not going to be directly related to a prostate carcinoma, Maybe some other breast carcinoma or an endometrial carcinoma, not from prostate carcinoma. I can rule this out as well. Prolonged use of tobacco. Fine. So prolonged use of tobacco can increase the risk. But again, I have a patient with a 45 year old having a prostate cancer. So when it's a 45 year old having a prostate cancer, am I right in saying that definitely there is some genetic component involved? Because 45 years is a bit early to have a prostate carcinoma, right? It's definitely a bit early uh, finding to cause a prostate carcinoma. So this can increase the risk of prostate cancer to some extent. Actually, smoke is not directly linked to prostate cancer, but very, very rare association of prostate cancer might be there. 
but since the age group is very less there's definitely a risk factor for genetic mutation to happen so gstp1 this might have been new to you this is one of the commonest gene which has been researched a lot it's a very very early uh, stimulant or an uh, uh, which produces or results in the prostatic cancer there is glutathione s transferase okay gstp stands for glutathione s transferase p gene okay so that's gstp so this is involved in the early tumorogens of prostatic carcinoma do remember that fine so that might come in the future exam because prostate carcinoma genetics is not much asked in your couple of years back they ask gleason scoring if they want to continue something related to prostate cancer you might require this fine okay so those are the three mcqs uh, which we are going to discuss today i'll go to the images whatever we're going to read in uh, from your ovary tumor starting till your breast parenchyma how much of a time permits will go go ahead and do that fine okay ready like you should i want you guys to answer i know you guys answer on the unacademy app i want the same response here as well so let's see let's see if you can uh, lead to it see this is the first image i'll give you a clue i want you to see what it is uh, staphylococcus it's not so much well developed as of now we have pathogenesis model set up like your adenoma carcinoma sequence for L every other adenocarcinoma maybe in future i might have a marker using the gstp1 which might come uh, fruitful in future right that is the ideal goal for an early diagnosis as of now not possible right so let's assume this is an uh, this image is an laparotomy image so tell me what do you think about it i told you we are going to discuss something related to ovarian tumors what are you seeing in this laparotomy image this actually the skin you can see it's been retracted any clues if you want something suggestive of it this is the clue this is the biopsy finding of that what do you see in the biopsy what color It's a classical color there. I'm sure you know the color. I have clear areas. Whenever I see clear areas in a microscopy, what are the things comes to my mind? And that's not leiomyoma. Whenever there are clear areas, things which comes to your mind is either fat or mucin. Let's say that here it is mucin. Why I'm preferring mucin is what are these cells? I'm sure you'll pick them up. The cells on the top. I'm sure you can pick them up. These are columnar epithelium with goblet cells, right? So you have goblet cells on the top, and you have mucin below them. Fine. So when you have mucin in the microscopy, what could be the gross finding? Now I think it's very easy for us. Gross finding. What is that? You're having mucin in the microscopy. So gross finding of an abdomen. I can many clues, plenty of clues. It's kind of a metastatic uh, study. Okay, this is actually a gross finding of pseudomyxoma peritonei. Okay, right, this is a gross finding of pseudomyxoma peritonei. You are not able to appreciate mucin much, but you can see the glistening surface. Actually, the surface here it's a little bit glistening. It's an uh, opened up abdomen. Since it's not an ovary, bone or mucinous cystadenoma could have been the precursor lesion. It could be mucinous cystadenoma. Or a cystadenoma carcinoma, Mus ovarian mucinous tumor can cause this. Can any one of you add which other oh, primaries can result in pseudomyxoma peritonei? And jelly belly looks right. Good one. Appendicular appendicular carcinoma can yes, Ian. Anything else? Appendix can, ovary can. One more. You have to think of one more neoplasm whenever you are discussing pseudomyxoma peritonei. Third one being. Colonic mucinous mucin secreting colonic adenocarcinoma. Right? Look at appendix, look at ovary, and look at uh, colonic carcinoma. These are the common primaries which can result in pseudomyxoma peritone. Fine. That's the first image. We'll go to the next thing. I just want to comment on this. There are two things here: a gross and a microscopy. Let's assume there's a lesion and there's a microscopic image corresponding. Fine. All of them, whatever we're going to discuss, are ovarian lesions. So that's a clue. I'll give you one more clue. Uh, this thing, this appearance, we saw somewhere recently. We saw somewhere recently this particular appearance. If you look at the cells, they are single stratified layer or single layer. All these cells, what are we seeing? Stratified or single? It's definitely stratified, right? I'm having a stratified epithelium. Uh, Dysgeminoma seminoma is a good differential diagnosis on a microscopy. Uh, on a gross microscopy not ideally 
So I'm having a stratified lining. It's not a dystrophinoma. I'll tell, I'll show you why it's not a dystrophinoma. Multiple lining epithelium, stratified epithelium is seen here. There are only two stratified epithelium in my body. One is your squamous. The other one is this, urothelium. So I'm telling you these are urothelial nests. So now tell me your diagnosis. Urothelial nests in a solid ovarian tumor. Diagnosis? Brenner's, right? Great. This is how a Brenner's tumor looks. Fine. Brenner's tumor looks like this. Bladder epithelium in your ovary has to be Brenner's, right? Brenner's can be benign. Brenner's can be moderate. Brenner's can also be malignant. Fine. Brenner's on a microscopy, uh, on a higher power microscopy, that's a classical appearance of the neoplastic cell. That was also an MCQ. What is the classical appearance of Brenner's tumor? This is the classical appearance. What is that called as? You call them a coffee bean nuclei, right? Coffee bean nuclei is classically seen in Brenner's tumor. Though I am not able to appreciate that in this power. When you go to higher power, you can easily appreciate that, fine. Can any of, any one of you add other coffee bean nuclei uh, tumors? There are quite a few tumors which can have coffee bean nuclei. Brenner is one. There's one more ovarian tumor, name that first. Granulosa cell tumor can have, right, perfect addition. You can have papillary carcinoma thyroid having coffee bean appearance. Langerhans cell histiosis, have, histiosis having coffee bean appearance, right? There are quite a few tumors which can have a coffee bean appearance. One amongst them is Brenner, right, perfect. So two of you answered dysgeminoma seminoma. I know why you answered that, because this, when you look at the growth, a microscopic image, it looks like a nesting pattern, right? It's a neurothelial nest. It's not a tumor, dysgeminoma tumor cell nest. Why it's not a dysgeminoma nest is two findings. In dysgeminoma, in the intervening septa, what cells do you find? This is the intervening septa here between the nests of tumor cells. In the intervening septa, in a dysgeminoma, I should see lymphocytes. I'm not seeing lymphocytes here. That's my first finding, right? Always intervening septa should have lymphocytes. That's why it's very, very characteristic for either dysgeminoma or a seminoma equivalent. Second thing, dysgeminoma nucleus, the cytoplasm will have a clear cytoplasm, right? Because of your uh, glycogen storage. This is not a clear cytoplasm. This is a very, very pink cytoplasm. If you look at this, this is definitely not a clear cytoplasm. I mean, if you want, I'll zoom this up. You have a kind of a pink cytoplasm, right? It's not much of a clear cytoplasm. So it's neither clear cytoplasm nor I have lymphocytes. So it's unlikely to be a dysgeminoma, fine. So these are two points against dysgeminoma. But yes, that's a very good differential diagnosis. Glad we sorted it out. So you won't have any confusion in future, fine? Okay. Uh, yes, Sankhati. Collagen deposition, that's fibrosis with your lymphocytes, fine? Great. I'll go to the next one. That's a classical finding. Diagnosis, it's a spotter. All of you should answer this. There's nothing but your classical teratoma, right? So I have a few questions regarding teratoma, fastest finger first, right? Dermoid teratoma, whatever it is. Teratomas in women, are they benign, borderline or malignant? Teratomas in women are most likely benign, right? Mature cystic teratoma, they are most likely benign, fine? Second question, in teratoma, Microscopic classification of teratoma has multiple things. I can call them mature, I can call them immature, and I can call them malignant as well. So what epithelium should I find in microscopy or what structure should I find in microscopy to name something as immature teratoma? There's one characteristic finding. If you see that epithelium or char that characteristic microscopic finding, I will think of an immature teratoma. What is it finding? Immature teratoma, if you find neuroepithelium, primitive neuroepithelium, perfect, you think of an immature teratoma. Great. Yeah. So again, a leading question to that. It's a primitive neuroepithelium, right? See, if it's a mature brain tissue, it doesn't matter. It should be primitive neural epithelium. So when I say something is primitive, can I call them blastemal component? Anything primitive, anything very young or undifferentiated, we use the term blastemal, right? So the only clue for you is, if in a teratoma, you have areas of small round blue cells, I'm going to call it an immature neuroepithelium, right? Be very careful. It should be a primitive immature neuroepithelium. If it's a normal brain tissue, it is not immature teratoma. It is mature teratoma only because normal brain tissue definitely can be there. If you look at this, this is an image from Robbins. This structure here is your brain parenchyma actually. 
when you have a brain parenchyma, that doesn't quantify it to be an immature teratoma. It's mature. I have skin. You can see the skin. You can see the adnexal glands. You can see your your keratin, right? So I have all three germ layers. So definitely, it's a mature teratoma. Robbins is one more image of a primitive neuroepithelium, like you guys said. If it's primitive, it is blastemal, and it should look like this. Can I say that entire thing here is small, round, and blue? Undoubtedly, right? This definitely small round blue cell. This how a primitive neuroepithelium looks. Only when it's a primitive neuroepithelium, I call them a small round. I call them an immature teratoma. Actually, for a postgraduate, while reporting, I have to grade the immature teratoma into grade one and two based on the component or the percentage of neuroepithelium present. But for you, it's not required. You know, primitive neuroepithelium present, it becomes immature. The prognosis slightly drops. Fine. So in men, what we read about teratoma previously. Uh, in the last class in testicular teratoma, I told that teratoma in testis has two different classification. One is associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ. The other one is not associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ. If any of you remember that, tell me which will be not associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ, prepubertal or postpubertal. In men, which will be not associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ. Is a classical thing. I'm sure you remember that. Prepubertal teratomas will not be associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ, and they do have a very very good prognosis, right? Perfect. Postpubertal teratoma will have will be with germ cell neoplasia in situ, and they don't have a good prognosis. Fine. Perfect. Okay. Great. Go to the next one. This is Potter again. Diagnosis. Great. Spotter, diagnosis. You should say this diagnosis. This is a classical Schiller dual bodies, right? This is your glomeruloid bodies. You can see the blood vessel in the center. You can see the RPCs ideally. You have a vessel in the center and surrounded by Schiller dual bodies, actually, you'll have two layers of tumor cells. Okay. Two layers of tumor cells. Surrounded by a central vessel, it's a classical Schiller dual body, or your endodermal sinus tumor, or your glomeruloid body, or your yolk sac tumor, right? So it's a classical case of a yolk sac tumor. To diagnose yolk sac tumor, I did say them while discussing testicular tumor as well. One tumor marker is useful. Yolk sac tumor is positive for which tumor marker? That tumor marker is also an immunohistochemistry. Yolk sac tumors are positive for. I'm sure you know that. The IHC for yolk sac tumor as well as the tumor marker for yolk sac tumor is alpha fetoprotein, right? Alpha fetoprotein, perfect Sadwik. Alpha 1 antitrypsin is also an IHC, but alpha fetoprotein is a tumor marker as well as IHC, fine? The only thing required for yolk sac tumor diagnosis in an MCQ or mostly even a real life is also age. Age is the most important thing. The tumor originates from yolk sac, that's why I call them a yolk sac tumor. So, what do you think will be the age? It has to be less than 5 years. Almost every time, if it's a pure yolk sac tumor, it never, almost never happens after five years of age. Most likely two years, one year age, right? One year, two year age, you are going to have a ovarian or a testicular tumor. It has to be a yolk sac tumor, fine? Okay. The next one. Now, again, a spotter diagnosis. It's also a lesion in the ovary, so diagnosis. Yes, children, right? I'm sure you'll be able to answer this. Tell me whatever comes to your mind. I'm not going to give you any history, any clue. Great. Good again. Rishab, are you okay with this germinoma? You're the other person who answered this germinoma for that uh, Brenner's tumor. Yes. We saw two findings for a germinoma. I said you should have fibrous septa with lymphocytic infiltrate. That is there here. This is your fibrous septa, right? And definitely you can see the small round blue cells. These are your lymphocytic infiltrates, right? That is definitely present. The second one, I have lots of clear cytoplasm, tumor cells with the clear cytoplasm, right? So I have both tumor cells with clear cytoplasm and I do have lymphocytes in the septa. This is diagnostic of a dysgerminoma. If it is in testis, seminoma, right? First question, what are these tumor cells positive for? 
what is the clear cytoplasm positive for? I want a stain which will highlight the clear cytoplasm. I don't want IHC. I want a stain which highlights the clear cytoplasm. Which is PAS, right? Yeah, clap will be positive or 3 by 4 will be positive. But I wanted the glycogen content. This tumor cell is clear because of the glycogen content in the tumor. That will be positive for pass. Fine. Perfect. So like you guys said, your OCT 3 bar 4, the NANOG, all of them are IHCs, right? While discussing testicular tumor, I told that seminoma is actually kind of a very close differential diagnosis for embryonal carcinoma sometimes. Not whatever image comes to you, but sometimes they're very close differential diagnosis. Because seminoma and embryonal carcinoma almost look similar, I told one marker which will be positive in seminoma and it will be negative in embryonal carcinoma because these both will be positive for both. I told you to remember that the marker which will be positive in seminoma, which will be positive in disgeminoma as well, CD117 or CKIT, right? Do remember this. CD117 as well as CKIT will be positive for disgeminoma and seminoma, which will not be positive for your embryonal carcinoma, right? Because it helps me sometimes in differential diagnosis in difficult cases. I remember you had a question a couple of three, four years back, a testicular tumor in a 40 year old person which is positive for CD1 was the question. Answer was seminoma, fine. Embryonal carcinoma will not be positive for that, do remember that. Yes, SAL4 is also a very good fine, a marker, fine. It's a recent marker, but definitely it's a good marker, okay. Next, diagnosis. Tell me whatever comes to your mind. Even if it's wrong, it's completely fine. We're just gonna learn here. There's an IHC on the one side and a normal HNA on the other side. Try to give a differential diagnosis. If not, I'll give you, I'll tell you what IHC is that. Great. Great. Though there are very, very subtle findings in the microscopy. Great, you found it out. I both dope my and in. Good. So what is this finding? I'll highlight this. Though it's not so perfect. Does it look like a Carl Exner body? Tumor cells surrounded. I'll come to Chakadi. Tumor cells surrounding a pink space, right? That's a Carl Exner body, fine. So this is actually a granulosa cell tumor. So if this is granulosa cell tumor, you guys have to say what IHC is this. So I know the diagnosis, so definitely you should say the IHC. It's a very classical IHC of granulosa cell tumor. What is IHC? Ah, uh, not interested. Right? It's your inhibit. Just a second. Okay, that's your inhibin IHC, fine. Secondly, whatever you said is right. CD117 will be positive in GIST also. CD117 is kind of an uh, kinase. It's just a kinase, right? So any kinase can be kinase can be positive in many tumors. It's not only this. CD117 seek it is positive in case of your mastocytosis, fine. It's positive in many, many conditions. Along with that, it's also positive in your dysgeminoma. It's also positive in this. Yes, you are right. Okay, great. This inhibit and the granulosa cell tumor. Few leading questions in granulosa cell tumor. If you remember granulosa cell tumor, uh, do you remember any genetic change in granulosa cell tumor? There's one genetic change which is very, very important for granulosa cell tumor. What is that? There's one genetic change which is particularly seen in adult granulosa cell tumor. What is that? Perfect. Fox L2. It's a transcription factor which is predominantly mutated in only in an adult granulosa cell tumor. It's not mutated in your juvenile granulosa cell tumor. It will be seen only in adult granulosa cell tumor. Though it is not useful for diagnosis as of now because I have very good findings and microscopy as well as a very good marker for diagnosing. I won't require this, right? Granulosa cell tumor in a woman. Uh, how do you think the patient will present? Because that's a unique tumor in an ovary. How do you think patient will present? Granulosa cell tumor, how do you think the patient will present? Estrogen production. So the patient most likely will present with your uh, your endometrial proliferation. Precautious puberty could have been a finding of a juvenile granulosa cell tumor. In an adult granulosa cell tumor, which is much more common, you'll have menorrhagia or an metrhagia, increased bleeding in during the menstrual cycle, right? That's how the patient will present, right? Great. 
Those are two different findings of an analysis of tumor. So you've seen whatever images are in Robbins for ovarian lesions, right? Robbins also includes your uh, gestational trophoblastic tumor and placenta. They do talk about the chorea anonitis and everything. I'm not going into it. We just have a quick look about identity form mode, fine? Because identity form mode might be required for an MCQ. Right? So we have two things, a complete mode and a partial mode. I'm sure you must have seen that. You must have seen this diagram in multiple, multiple places, right? The only thing in complete mole is, it's always an empty ovum. Complete mole will never have a female component. It's always androch. It's always the male component only. Either a single sperm fuses and chromosomal duplication happens or two forms fuses and chromos and it fuses and to form a zygote, fine. It's either 46XX or it could be 46XY also. It is normal number of chromosomes, but still what? It, there'll be no fetal tissue, obviously, right? So when you have only one component, only men component, it cannot form a zygote, it cannot form a fetus. That's why you don't have a fetal tissue. Because if there is no female component, only when male and female component joins, you will have a fetal parenchyma. Here, female component is there, male component is there, but it is in excess. That's why I do have a fetal tissue. Fetal tissue is present, plus it undergoes abortion. You know the reason for abortion. Abortion, I am having 69 chromosomes. It will not work. It will not be, it will not be viable. Though in the first thing it is 46 chromosomes, it's at the end of the day it's just sperm tissue. It cannot form a baby, right? So it is no fetal parenchyma will be seen. That's the reason a complete mole will not have a fetal parenchyma and a partial mole may have, may not have a fetal parenchyma. It's dependent on the time of uh, death, time of the abortion. It depends uh, whether it's formed or not formed, fine. Right? Most likely it will be there right so based on the absence of maternal component in a complete mole we used an immunohistochemistry to diagnose them what IHC is that I'm sure you must have read them what IHC is that based on the maternal component absence in a complete mole we used an IHC for diagnosis KIP2 what's the other name for KIP2 actually I want the other name for KIP2 KIP2 is fine, but the first name is more useful. That's what we order. It's P57 KIP2. KIP2 is actually the subtype. P57 is more important, right? I'll write P57 here. P57, sorry, P57, 153. Okay. So you have P57 KIP2. KIP2 is, as I said, it's a subtype. P57 is more important, right? So P57 is a normal gene which is expressed from the maternal side so in a complete mole this is normally expressed in any maternal parenchyma tissue you and me will have p57 but it comes from the mother so in a complete mole i don't have a maternal parenchyma right because there is no ovum so a complete mole will be negative will a partial mole be positive or negative because partial mole has ovum, the maternal component, so partial mole will be positive and a complete mole will be negative. So it might sometimes help me in coming to a diagnosis, fine. I'll give you another history. Uh, let me see how many of you can come to an answer. A person at age 25 had an abortion. Post uh, abortion, the abortus was looked into the microscopy. There were no grape-like vesicles. The chromosome was 46XX, completely normal. And the microscopy, P57, was positive. What is your diagnosis? I'll repeat, 25-year-old abortion, abortus, no gross, no grape-like vesicles, nothing seen. Microscopy has villi. Microscopy, P57 is positive. Chromosome analysis is 46. What is your diagnosis? Can anyone come to a diagnosis? It's fine if you're wrong, it's just to learn. Is it partial mood? And so how many of you with, are with Tejashree? You can just say plus one if you're with her. I told P57 is positive. Okay. So can it be a normal abortus? Is that possible? Can it be a normal abortus? normal emotion not a molar pregnancy it is not a partial mole right the reason why i wanted to ask you is partial mole will have p57 positivity that's correct 
but partial mole always will be 69 chromosomes when you have 46 chromosomes plus p57 positive which means this is neither complete mole based on this so neither complete mode based on p57 but this could be completely a normal abortus so keep in mind whenever you have a history of abortus it need not be molar pregnancy it could be just a normal abortus right you can have a normal abortus could be some other uh, cause first trimester or second trimester there are many causes of abortion right always it need not be molar pregnancy p57 will be positive in a normal abortion and also partial mode okay keep that in mind fine so as a classical finding what is this finding what is this finding the classical finding it's uterus filled with the grape like vesicles though it doesn't look like grape like vesicles it's a very very low power image right this is your complete molar pregnancy your grape like vesicles is very very characteristic actually it is called as an hydatiform mole right it looks like an hydatid cyst if you remember reading hydatid cyst in liver uh, you must have read about hydatid cyst will have something called some tender coconut appearance right very tiny cyst like spaces so this cyst like spaces looks like an hydatid cyst so we call them hydatiform mole i cannot use oid again because it's hydatid there right so grape like vesicle it's also called as a hydatiform molar pregnancy so this is a microscopy of it so it's definitely much 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 dilated villi okay look at this this red color whatever i'm highlighting this is the size of normal villi a normal villi will be like that it's it will be like a tiny gland that's all when i have such a huge villi i can undoubtedly call it an definitely a dilated molar dilated villi in in conjunction with an abortus i can call it an hydatiform mole fine okay great so we know a little bit about molar pregnancy and we know a little bit about ovarian tumors as well fine just the last one in the female genital tract any thoughts diagnosis any thought and diagnosis Uh, Pratyuma lacrimal caruncle the per better person to answer should it be an ophthalmologist but it's something swelling in the medial side of the eyelid that's the only thing I know I did, don't know much about it please confirm with an ophthalmologist if you're having something of that sort please consult an ophthalmologist fine okay this is a uterus so tell me your diagnosis okay can I say that whatever lesion it is it is invading the uterine wall it is definitely invading the uterine wall right it's kind of jutting outside and kind of going outside as well i'm having a red fleshy mass in the uterine wall which is coming from the uterine lumen so what is the diagnosis this is how your choriocarcinoma will look on the cross okay there's nothing but a choriocarcinoma it's definitely invasive so it's nothing but a choriocarcinoma choriocarcinoma in microscopy can be very very bizarre it's this image is not so pleomorphic it can be very 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 pleomorphic it can be extremely hemorrhagic. You'll have both syncytial trophoblast and cytotrophoblast, right? That's what you'll see in choriocastoma on a microscopic image. Few leading questions in choriocastoma. The common site of metastasis for choriocastoma. What is the common site of mets? I'm sure you know the common site of metastasis. Anyone? Lungs are the common site of metastasis for choriocastoma, right? Perfect. What is the uh, chemotherapy regimen given for choriocastoma? That's also a question in your uh, uh, obstetrics and gynecology. The cannonball secondaries, yes. I suppose you have a regimen called an EMACO regimen. That's the thing given for your choriocastoma is fine. And beta HCG is definitely a tumor marker. And also beta HCG is your IHC marker as well. Fine. Great. Cannonball metastasis. Fine. Methotrexate or an EMACO regimen. Fine. Okay. Great. Now we'll slightly move to breast parenchyma. Right. So I want you to look at this image. See what I first explain what you're seeing. There's a biopsy from breast. Then we'll come to a diagnosis. If you explain whatever you're seeing, coming to a diagnosis is definitely easier. Just explain in any word whatever comes to your mind what you're seeing here. I don't want exact diagnosis, just whatever comes to your mind. So this is definitely the surrounding adipose tissue, right? That's a surrounding adipose tissue. I'm sure all of you will make out. 
This is a very very low power image. And what is this? What do you think is whatever stroma is increased? Great. I'll take whatever you in said. Can I call it instead of increased stroma? Can I call it fibrotic? Can I call that? A slit like space. Fine, great. Okay, a slit like duct and an increased stroma with surrounding fibros, right? So when I have a slit like duct here, I'll just it is not actually slit like duct. It is actually a dilated duct since it's in very very low power it looks like a slit like duct i'll zoom in a little bit can you see the secretion inside the duct is it possible for you to appreciate the secretion inside the duct i'll erase what i drew can you see the secretion inside the duct possible so i do have a dilated duct with secretions inside them surrounded by fibrosis so i'll give you a history of this now uh, then try to uh, come to a conclusion this patient presented with a mass because there are secretion inside the duct this secretion came outside as a nipple discharge with a blood tinge or a greenish nipple discharge and in microscopy i'm seeing actually is a dilated duct with surrounding fibrosis and inflammation a chronic inflammation what will be the diagnosis what fits into this a mass which is palpable and you have a nipple discharge with a dilated duct surrounded by perfect surrounded by your inflammation it's a duct ectasia perfect right so duct ectasia there are multiple stages it's not a papilloma i'll show you a papilloma because i'm not seeing papillary projections here right so duct ectasia if the initial part if i take a biopsy i will have a duct which is going to be like this the initial part i'll have an extremely dilated duct if it goes to a little bit later part the duct ruptures so induces inflammation and surrounding fibrosis that will be seen in the later stages fine papilloma i'll show you pages also i'll show you for sure fine since we are in the papilloma we'll easily can finish papilloma it'll be much easier for us look at this can i say that this is also a dilated duct undoubtedly the duct is definitely huge here so here can you see the papillary projections yes i hope you will be able to appreciate the papillary projections here right this is an intra ductal papilloma this also clinically it will be some somewhat the similar history you'll have a nipple discharge which can be blood tinge and you can have a sub areolar mass right this is how an intra ductal papilloma looks right i hope uh, yin and priyanka is is it's possible for you to differentiate an intra ductal papillary growth and just a duct without much of a trouble fine okay the next image i have two images here i'll just highlight the first image then we'll go to the second one if you look at the first image here can i say that there are two layers of epithelium i'm sure you can appreciate two layers of epithelium right so if you can appreciate two layers of epithelium here like when we discussed prostate i told you when i have dual layering of epithelium it's a normal gland both prostate and breast will have epithelial cell and myoepithelial cell right so double layering of epithelium is always normal one formed of epithelium and the other formed by myoepithelial cells let's see how good your memory is when we were discussing prostate i told you that uh, myoepithelial cell have a marker what is the marker i told one ihc marker can anyone tell me the ihc marker myoepithelial cell marker which i said which i personally like is p63 right there are many many markers one of the markers is p63 not 53 fine right? so the first duct what are you are seeing is a normal duct parenchyma so compare that to this what do you think is happening the second image what do you think is happening definitely like uh, sang sangdeep said that it's hyperplasia right it's in case of an epithelial hyperplasia this is just epithelial hyperplasia i am not calling it dcas because i am not having much of pleomorphism all of them looks similar it's nothing but an epithelial hyperplasia i'll zoom into it it's proliferation i'm right in saying that i am able to appreciate the second outer lining as well can you see the myoepithelial lining also it's kind of flattened right so myoepithelial lining is also appreciated all surrounding the duct only epithelial hyperplasia is happening so it's not a carcinoma if myoepithelial cell goes away it is carcinoma it's seen actually all over in dca is also it will be irregular it's seen all over with hyperplasia 
that's what i'm going to call it my epithelial hyperplasia fine uh, we have a group of disease called as benign proliferative breast diseases your intraductal papilloma comes into that your epithelial hyperplasia also comes into that right this image just comment on whatever you're seeing in this image we need not go to a diagnosis i just want you to comment whatever you think comment on that what is more that's enough more than enough for me there are only two component of breast parenchyma the duct lobule and the stroma what do you think is more here perfect there are definitely increased glands i do accept that right if you look at the glands in the center they are looked like they have been pulled apart right uh, in the center especially if you look at this area can i say that the gland is kind of elongated and stretched definitely it's kind of elongated and stretched glands right in the center you can see that glands are not like this in the center they are like this they are like this right they are glands which is definitely hyperplastic plus in the center it's been pulled all apart so what do you think would have pulled the glands and made it like a slit what do you think must have done that or it's compressing it can i say that fibrosis will do this will fibrosis make a gland like this it definitely can right so i want you to name the lesion i'm having increase in number of glands like you said and i'm having fibrosis which is kind of pull the glands and make it a little bit narrower so can you make name the lesion i just want you to compare combine these two findings and name the lesion it's a very classical diagnosis you must have heard of this diagnosis for sure have you heard about a lesion called as sclerosing adenosis right so adeno means glands there is more number of glands here and definitely there is sclerosis as well right so it's sclerosing adenosis i'll come to uh, think that why it's not a fibro adenoma when you take fibro adenoma what happens is fibrous component the stromal component will be more and the adenoma component will be less right that's what will be happening in fibroadenoma not so much of glandular proliferation that's why it's not a fibroadenoma i'll show fibroadenoma soon fine okay okay uh, pradyuma precursor form of leukocytes uh, it can be myelocyte metamyelocyte promyelocyte there are many precursor forms of uh, your leukocytes fine if you're talking about neutrophil i call them all these okay look at this image and tell me what is your differential diagnosis you have a mammogram image and you have a gross image i want you to comment on the diagnosis you can comment on whatever comes to mind first need not be correct always this is just a learning curve for us does it look like perfect satvik it looks like a fibrous tissue on the cross and also in your mammogram it looks like a central scar and kind of radiates right so radial scar can be easily picked up on a mammogram but still you want to confirm that because if it is desmoplastic reaction also i might kind of have like a scar tissue a serous carcinoma also kind of has like a scar tissue right the central scar in breast parenchyma microscopy looks like that all this is scar tissue all this is scar tissue all this is scar tissue right so that's how a radial scar looks on clinical examination it might very closely mimic a carcinoma because of the firmness in a mammogram yes a good radiologist can easily differentiate radial scar and a carcinoma but still they do operate because there might be some residual microscopic glands which might be stuck here which may be abnormal to disprove that you have to undergo microscopy that's all right it's a radial scar it is not a precursor lesion this also comes in the benign proliferative breast disease spectrum only fine okay right so this we saw intraductal papilloma right so look at this we look at the first two images again this is a mammogram whatever white color you are seeing this is a guide wire where you if you have seen a mammogram how it's been done generally they put a guide wire to localize the lesion then they take a mammogram so that after immediately after mammogram they know how the extent of removal of the surgery for that only guide wire has been put fine if you look at the mammogram here what are these i'll highlight them i'm sure you'll pick them up i'm sure you'll know them as well you must have seen them what are those tiny tiny things you have marked in mammogram that's your calcification right microcalcification or macrocalcification perfect is a perfect case of an multiple dots 
perfect case of microcalcification, right? So if you compare the mammogram to your microscopy, I have comedo necrosis. If it's the same thing, see this is a dot calcification, 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 right? Multiple dots. So in the center of a necrotic tissue, when we call it in comedo necrosis, comedo necrosis type of DCS, the center alone I'll have necrosis. In the center alone I'll have calcification. That's why it looks like multiple dots, right? When you have multiple dots of calcification on a mammogram, the first thing to be suspected is your comedo necrosis. And this is comedo variant of ductal carcinoma in situ. This could very well be carcinoma. I'm not saying that it cannot, it can never be a carcinoma. It can very well be a carcinoma. So to differentiate carcinoma versus a ductal carcinoma in situ, what should be present? Leave breast parenchyma in any other disease, any, any other organ, difference between sharing between carcinoma in situ versus clear cut carcinoma. The only thing I'll require is invasion, right? If in cervix, it's invasion of basement membrane. Here I don't have that. Here I'll have your, here I'll have your loss of myoepithelial layer, right? In your DCS, my myoepithelial layer will be present, but patchily present. In a carcinoma, I won't have a myoepithelial layer at all. So if I do a P63 here, if it is positive, DCS. If it is negative, I'm going to go for carcinoma, fine? So look at this. Tell me what this is. Yes, Sakti. Ecadine loss will not be present in even in ductal carcinoma, right? It will be present even in ductal carcinoma. Ecadine loss will be not, Ecadine will be lost in lobular lesions, fine? Perfect. This is it. Uh, can you rephrase it, Nikhil? Instead of calling it a pseudo papillae, actually, there's one more term given for this papillae. We don't call it pseudo papillae. This image, Tejasri. Why did you call it pseudo papillae? So that it's easy for us to extrapolate from that. The reason you called it pseudo papillae must be you don't see a fibrovascular core, right? There's not much of a fibrovascular core, but it's looking like a papillary projection, right? So when you have a papillary projection without a fibrovascular core, because for every papillae, fibrovascular core is required. When you have a papillary projection without a fibrovascular core, we call them a micropapillary carcinoma. Good. We call them a micropapillary lesion, not an pseudopapilloma, fine? Use the micropapillary. Micropapillary is commonly seen in DCIS, as well as micropapillary will be seen in lung lesions, fine? So this is actually a micropapillary DCS. Micropapillary DCS are very, very tiny papillae. The problem with micropapillary is it can break off easily. Since there is no fibrovascular core, no one holding them. It's just like a projection of cells. It can break off. It can go to the distant site and spread. Micropapillary variant of DCAS or micropapillary variant of a carcinoma, they have a poor prognosis. They are not good. The prognosis is poor because they have more propensity for it to spread. Fine. You go to the next. This. What pattern is this? This is also a DCAS. What pattern is this? What pattern is this? Perfect. That's a cookie cutter or a cribriform appearance, right? So when you have a cribriform appearance of DCAS, uh, it has a good prognosis or a bad prognosis. Cribriform type of DCAS. It definitely has a very good prognosis. Do remember this. The reason I have put a star here is whenever you think of cribriform, the first thing comes to your mind is adenocystic carcinoma. Adenocystic carcinoma doesn't have a good prognosis, but a cribriform variant of a DCAS will have a good prognosis. Do remember that. Not only cribriform variant of DCAS, there are carcinomas called as cribriform carcinomas of breast that also has a good prognosis. The cribriform architecture in breast parenchyma has a good prognosis, not in other place of adenocystic carcinoma. Fine. Okay, great. Fine. I think we'll call it off today here. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow. We'll continue the same thing for the next five days. We will be going with breast cancer from now on. What I'll be discussing next thing is we'll look at the bloom richardson classification, different microscopy type of breast cancer, and maybe a few other images related to your fibroadenoma and phyllodes. Uh, it doesn't have a good prognosis, I think, because in, uh, if you're asking about cribriform, 
it comes with a Gleason 4. Uh, Gleason 4 score, it's not good. Gleason 3 is the best one. Fine. Okay. Do you have any other doubts? Uh, Pratima, I won't call it an homeostasis. I would call it an body's immune response. It's an immune response of the body against the bacterial pathogen. That's all. Homeostasis in the sense to maintain the normal equilibrium, right? I wouldn't personally call it a homeostasis, just a bacterial response. That's all. Okay. I don't know, Karthik. You'd ask her. Fine. So we have no doubt, we'll call it a day. I said that we'll complete that. Once we are done with breast, uh, we will go to the other things of endocrine, skin, bone, uh, muscle and sinus. Hopefully in the next four days, we'll be completing this. Once we complete this, we'll go uh, chapter wise as an MCQ part in your Academy app. So before NEET exam, we'll complete one one chapter. Hopefully at least pathology part, I'll take care. Rest of it, you should be studying well, fine. All the best. Uh, treat well if you have any point any doubts you can ping me in the telegram group i'll definitely answer for you fine thank you for your time good night have a nice night and happy valentine's day to you all enjoy with your loved ones